So I studied chemical engineering because I, well, <laughs> at the time I didn't really know what it was really about. I just knew that I liked my maths and my science. And then when I started my undergrad in 2014, I quickly learned that, um, well, chemical engineering is rather the process, the design of processes where we take raw materials, design that inter um, intermediate step for transforming the materials into a useful product. So in my high school years, I did an aptitude test for the university. Uh, it came back first choice for chemical engineering, which I didn't think of before, even though I really enjoyed maths and chemical compounds and any chemistry that I did at school. Um, I did enjoy problem solving, but I never related that to engineering. And as that, I always thought I'd do medicine first. And when both applications came through, I decided on chemical engineering, purely based on the math and the problem solving opportunities that I have, that I thought would satisfy me more in my academic and after academic career. I, I actually wanted to be a doctor at some stage in my life. And then I realized that I hate blood. <laughs> and then I guess as a doctor, you're gonna have to at some point deal with blood and that is not who I am, all right? And then the next best thing, because I was good in science and maths, happened to be engineering. And then when you come to engineering, you actually realize, that, okay, great, we're looking at the world in terms of like trying to create stuff, all right? But when it comes to chemical engineering, it's so diverse that you can actually bring in almost um, topics from different fields. It was very much to do with the fact that I like problem solving. I like working in a group. I like working on a project. I don't like doing the same thing over and over and chemical engineering seemed to be like the kind of thing where you have a project, you work on it, you have a lot of teamwork, you have a lot of different aspects that, that, that you work on and then at the end of a few years you have this, this thing that you built that you can see, this physical thing that you created and then you say okay cool and you move on to something else, something different. I really enjoyed you know, chemistry, physics, mathematics, programming, and I wasn't too sure what I wanted to do. I came across this degree and it was the perfect degree for me um, because it really brought together everything that I loved. Um, chemical engineers also can, can, it's a very diverse degree because you can end up in a whole array of different industries. You can end up in the oil industry, the mining industry. You can end up like I am in the sustainable energy industry. Hi, I'm uh, Professor Robbie Pott. I'm one of the academics here in the Department of Process Engineering at Stellenbosch University. Um, and I teach a couple of courses for the undergrads, including first year chemistry to all the engineers and fluid mechanics to the chemical engineers. Here we have the top floor of the annex in the new part of the chemical engineering building. We've got a, a big office for the postgrads to sit in and there are some offices for um, postdocs and for academics where you can find your lecturers. On this side of the building we have really large lecture theatres, state-of-the-art uh, projectors and so forth so that we can teach our undergraduate students. From the second year you'll be taught in, in these facilities rather than in the general engineering building. So here at the Department of Process Engineering, we are uh, very privileged to have this really large pilot scale facility with some of the biggest equipment in South Africa, particularly for, um, for a university setup. We've got all sorts of equipment here available for undergraduate um, practicals and for postgraduate research. For instance, we have on this side um, a Humphrey spiral, which we use for undergraduate practicals. 
Um, and the students will experiment on separating out ilmenite, which uh, you can convert into titanium, from beach sand. Um, so if you can see, there's a, a black stripe of material on the inside and, a, and a, the, the light silica gets thrown to the outside. Our students then, in the third year, uh, do these experiments and understand how this equipment works. On this side, we have uh, very large distillation columns and separation columns where we can demonstrate um, the principles of separation processes, how to, for instance, separate out crude oil into petrol and diesel kerosene, or to do other things like absorb carbon dioxide from a power station for carbon dioxide sequestration to prevent global warming. So here we have the anaerobic digesters where we convert food waste and agricultural waste into methane and carbon dioxide for use in heating or power, um, producing also fertilizer as a byproduct. On the end, we have a really large uh, pyrolysis setup where we can take waste plastic, potentially that we have recovered from the sea, and then uh, pyrolyze it to produce uh, fuels and energy uh, for use in other, in, other, in other ways, recycling that plastic instead of leaving it in the landfill. Over here we have some very large bioreactors that are mostly used in postgraduate research where we can take, for instance, um, waste material from the wood processing uh, industry and convert it into ethanol for use in fuel or for other uses, potentially. Um, so we'll grow up our yeast inside these reactors um, and then get a ethanol water solution out, which we then separate using the big columns which we discussed a little earlier. Inside of the building we have most of the, the lecturers offices so if you've got questions or concerns you can come on by and our lecturers are available for discussion. We also have some other classrooms that are um, on this side for, for smaller class teaching um, most in your third and fourth year. At the top floor here we have uh, some excellent analytical laboratories and, and scientists who will assist you uh, for your analysis and your particularly in your final year research project where you will be doing an investigation to some interesting phenomenon. And of course we have this amazing view as well. Our department is very lucky to have access to a fully equipped workshop which will be particularly useful in your final year when you've got to design an experiment. These. Um, pieces of equipment will help you build uh, the reactors that you will make and use for your final year project. Here we have the undergrad experimental laboratories where from your second year onwards you will do lots of experiments to understand how the equipment that you use as a chemical engineer works. You'll have pumps and pipes, you'll design and, and um, experiment on reactors of various types, uh, you'll look at heating and cooling systems, um, distillation columns, um, a number of different experiments and all set up in here in really nice uh, facilities.
On this side, we have more experimental lab space that is used for both our undergraduate and our postgraduate researchers. Um, undergraduates will spend some time in here doing uh, biological experiments, growing organisms of different types for, for bioprocesses. And if you decide to stay on for, for a postgraduate, uh, then you may do some experiments in here on uh, various different um, projects like algal digestion to produce valuable materials or gold recovery from waste circuit boards or chemical engineering has a number of different, different routes that you could choose to go down. Let's chat to some of our students about their projects. The project looks at lithium-ion battery cells that originate from laptop batteries. Most of them are always 18650 cells that look like this, which we cut open to open up and then we can separate the components from the different um, electrodes as well as the separator. And when you uncoil the insides, you end up with a string of material that looks like this. And you can see that the copper anode, this brownish color, is covered with graphite. We have a plastic separator separating the two coils preventing a short circuit and allowing the transfer of the lithium ions between the two electrodes. And then we have the cathode on the other side, which then collects the lithium during discharging. And this black powder is the high value metals, which we are trying to recover. And these metals are therefore transferred to solution by a powder like this. So we'll add the aqueous pregnant leach solution to the beaker. All the metals from the leach solution is now contained within that solution. And to extract some of the metals selectively, we then add extractants, which is an immiscible phase. So we add this slowly. So to ensure we do reach our optimum condition that we are trying to aim for, we then add a pH probe as the reaction is pH limited before starting the stirring. So we'll then turn on the stirring and let the reaction begin so that the metals can be transferred from the bottom phase upwards to the top phase. Once we've reached an emulsion, we can then adjust the pH by adding sodium hydroxide to increase the pH. As we approach our target equilibrium, we add less and less of the sodium hydroxide to ensure that we don't overshoot our targets on the pH. So when we're confident that we've reached our equilibrium, we can then halt the reaction as it will no longer exchange any metals between the two phases. And as the two phases separate, we can then separate the two phases to recover the metals separately from each other. So we typically do this with a separating funnel, which is here on the left-hand side. So I'll quickly pour it in here. After we've transferred the emulsion to the separating funnel, we can then allow some time for the two phases, which are not soluble within each other, to separate. As you can see, the barriers starting to move here and here, as they will now converge back to the two phases they started with. However, now we will have some of the metals trapped up top, which have reacted with some of the extractants, while the other metals remain below, allowing us to separate some of the metals selectively from the solution. So once the two phases have been completely separated, we can then take the um, separating funnel tap and draw the sample. We can then send this for further processing to remove more metal selectively in a subsequent process, 
while this can then be recovered from the organic phase to selectively then recover this metal separate from the other metals that we started with. This enables us to separate metals selectively, just enhancing the product purity and recoveries, as it's much easier now to separate the remaining metals without having these interfere with their separation processes. Okay, so I'm doing my PhD um, in bioprocessing, um, where we're focusing on extracting a compound from seaweed. This compound is called a fucoidin, which is pretty much a polysaccharide, which is sulfated, and it has a fucose backbone. So what this little molecule does is really pretty amazing. All research points out that it has really amazing biofunctionalities. This includes anti-cancer, antioxidant, and um, anti-diabetic, among others. So me coming from Limpopo, weirdly enough, I've seen a lot of um, cancer issues arising from close friends and close families. And then when I started reading about this molecule, that's when I figured, okay, this really sounds like a pretty great molecule to investigate further. And from a chemical engineering perspective, what we realize is that, okay, with bioactive molecules, when you extract them, you tend to affect their properties. And that's where now my research comes in. Now we're looking at how extraction methods affect bioactivities of this molecule, which is a picoidin. So what we have here is a bioreactor, which is pretty much coupled with an ultrasound. Right? Um, what we're trying to do here is basically trying to extract bioactives from seaweed. So I'm just gonna start the system and then I'll explain to you actually what's happening, right? Okay. Um, so what I did now is basically to allow my material to circulate between the bioreactor and the ultrasound system. The ultrasound is pretty much still off right now. I'm just gonna switch it off and hopefully it doesn't make noise for you guys. Okay. So now we have our ultrasound on and then how an ultrasound works is that you actually pass sound waves into a liquid media where you have um, particles. And then that sound waves actually causes what we call cavitation. And in, in this um, aspect, what we're trying to do is actually to pass those sound waves into a liquid media where we call the cav cavitation. And the cavitation will actually result in breaking up of the particles. Right, so that's what we're trying to do, and therefore, we'll therefore be able to extract our bioactives. Or we pretty much have optimized the system for extraction of our fucoidin, looking at factors such as temperature, um, your enzyme dosage, your ultrasound intensity, um, and we want to see actually how we can actually intensify such a process, or if there would be some sort of like synergistic interaction between your enzyme and ultrasound in recovering what we spoke about, which is our fucoidin. Right, that's pretty much the explanation of the setup. We will take samples here, and then we filter them up so we can have our liquid fractions off. In that liquid fractions, that's where we have our bioactives. I spoke about fucoidin, laminarine, and alginate. Right, with the fucoidin, then because it will be in solution, we then want to recover that into a solid form. So we take our our solution again into a filtration step, where then after the filtration, we concentrate up our Fucoidin fraction, and then after that, we add ethanol to that solution to actually precipitate again the fucoidin out. All right, and then we dry that, and then that's the bioactive that we will then have. All right, so as part of bioprocess engineering, one of the aspects that we also deal with is looking at a process uh, more renewable energy based, um, a process rather called anaerobic digestion where we take organic based um, feedstocks rather and what we do is we put it in a closed system that is absent of oxygen, that's what anaerobic means, and we have a series of or rather consortium of bacterial species that break down these organics and they give off a mixture of carbon dioxide and methane. Now methane gas has a, high, a highly notable energy value to it where we use to combust, produce steam and subsequently produce power. And what I'm doing here is I've got one anaerobic digester where I'm feeding tomato waste in a semi-continuous mode. In other words, per day, I add a certain volume of waste 
while taking out waste at the bottom. So my bucket of tomato waste, which is somewhat like this, it's about five liters of tomato waste that I'm gonna feed into this reactor. But first, what I'm gonna do is analyze the methane content in this gas right now. So as you can see here, as um, the oxygen levels are plummeting, that's a good sign that we have a completely anaerobic system. So as you see, methane balanced with carbon dioxide, oxygen continues to uh, plummet, and hydrogen sulfide is a nasty little odorous compound that gets formed depending on how much sulfur is in our organic mixture here. And then we see that this is our final value here, which we then um, try to figure out how much methane is in our produced biogas. Before I feed these five liters here, I need to extract about five liters at the bottom here to keep the volume, um, you know, set rather. Right, so this is our digested material here and we basically look at what was put in versus what comes out and it's a very brown dark sludgy mixture which is highly nutritious and whatever's left over from you know the system then here comes the best part we're gonna feed this all into the reactor here okay then we close it back up again and now we basically fed our system with its nutrients for the day, depending on how much you want to feed it. So basically, as the bugs chow down on its new organics, it gives off methane as the byproduct, and we use this system to measure a certain volume of gas. How much are we producing from tomatoes? And you get pretty good yields, actually. And at the end of the day, so much food waste is actually tossed aside, goes to landfall, and there's all, this, you know, all these issues, rather, about money being lost as well as environmental has when it comes to organic wastes being disposed of whereas we can rather reuse this waste generate methane power and high quality fertilizer which at the end of the day is one of the best renewable energy solutions out there but this is why i'm actually so passionate about this stuff it is the future My project has to do with membrane distillation, which is a hybrid of a membrane and a temperature-driven process. It has a membrane and you heat it up to a certain temperature, but you don't heat it up all the way to boiling point. So it operates as a lower temperature um, than temperature-driven processes, which means it's less energy intensive. And it, um, it can handle very, very, very salty feeds. What this has to do with environmental engineering is firstly desalination is something you need to clean up wastewater in mines and in all kinds of industrial processes. Um, you need to clean it up to save the environment, you have to clean it up according to law um, and desalination helps with that and the more you can desalinate a feed the cleaner you can make it. Um, and also obviously you want things to be as energy efficient as possible. The more energy you put into a system, the more energy you need to get off the grid, the more coal you need to burn. Um, so more energy efficient is, is better. I have a little vessel over here that I had the workshop build for me. Uh, sometimes, we, sometimes I need something specific and then I do a little design and I send it into the workshop and we do it together to build something specific like this. This is a vessel that's heated with heat tracing around it um, so that I can heat up my feet. And at the, this is actually the bottom. At the bottom, I have a membrane. I have the feed inside, I have the membrane at the bottom, and I have water that vaporizes through the membrane to um, give me clean permeate. I have a very a paper thin, um, few nanometers thick membrane that I capture in between two gaskets so that it seals properly. And then I have some spaces to do two things. The one is to keep the membrane in place, to keep it from getting damaged, from moving around. If it, if it crinkles a little bit, I get a rip and then the whole thing is useless. And also uh, to help keep the flow turbulent on the membrane. So. On the membrane itself, I want the water that moves over the membrane to mix as it moves. And this spacer 
right over the membrane forces the water to kind of mix around it so it's, so it's nice and mixed so it doesn't flow too, too smoothly over the membrane. I can just pour in the feed, which at this point is just distillated water. And then I can put in on my lid and in my stirrer. So this one is for temperature control. And these two are just to keep track of the temperature um, closest to the heat tracing where it will be a little bit hotter and in the center of the of the vessel will, will, will be cooler. Ideally the temperature would be the same so I'm going to try and get my mixing fast enough so that the temperature is relatively constant. It won't be but as constant as I can get it. Also fast enough to keep the crystals in the feed in suspension but not so fast that it creates a whirlwind that damages my membrane. So I'll play with the stir a little bit so to find out what speed works for me. So the focus of my research is on the design of a biogas fueled refrigerator. So compared to the refrigerator in your kitchen that runs on electricity, this one runs entirely on heat. So that heat can come from multiple sources. You can burn firewood, you can burn fossil fuels. But in my research, I burn biogas. For my experimentation, I'm using um, cow manure, fish blood, uh, water hyacinth. You can use food scraps and even sewage um, to produce this biogas, which makes it a, a very sustainable project because what you're effectively doing is you're taking waste, organic waste, and you're converting that into green energy. So what's happening over here, um, these are tiny little anaerobic digesters that are currently producing biogas. What I'm doing with this um, experimental setup is I'm testing how much biogas is produced by these different organic um, materials so that I can calculate how big the digester will need to be to produce enough biogas to fuel a refrigerator. So in these reactors, we currently have a mixture of the microbes and then these different organic materials that I mentioned, like fish blood, for example. Um, and they're currently breaking it down and producing the gas. As the gas is being produced, it goes up this little tube. Um, and from there, it moves on to these little green flaps in the back here. What's happening there is biogas is accumulating underneath the green flap, which slowly lifts the green flap up and that's a way of measuring how much biogas is being produced. Once enough has accumulated and the flap lets go of the bubble, um, it moves to these blue solutions over here. So those are very concentrated solutions of sodium hydroxide and what they do is they scrub the gas clean. They remove all of the gases except the methane. So leaving these little um, vials or bottles rather, uh, you have pure methane going to that set of flaps over there, which is, works in exactly the same way as those. And they measure the amount of methane that's being produced. In reality, these digesters would be much bigger. Um, I've done some calculations and it seems like I would need a digester that's about um, 3,000 liters big. These are only 500 milliliters. So this is the refrigerator that I've modified to run on biogas. It is currently running on biogas. It's performing pretty well. It's currently at minus 19 degrees Celsius. This refrigerator is like the normal refrigerators that you use when you go camping. Usually they've, they've been built to run on what's called LPG. So that's the normal gas that you use when you're cooking. Um, it's like kitchen gas. What I'm actually doing with this experimentation is I'm trying to find out how well this refrigerator performs when it's running on biogas. Um, so how much biogas does this refrigerator need to consume um, to reach a specific temperature? Knowing that, I can calculate how big the anaerobic digester will need to be to continuously produce enough biogas to fuel this refrigerator. I grew up in Stellenbosch and I was in Stellenbosch High School. And Stellenbosch University was the closest university, not only, but it was also the most beautiful one I've seen as of yet, and 
I really was impressed by the websites. I really enjoyed the winter week opportunity we had, as well as the welcoming nature of all the staff members when I was here for a demo. And I was really impressed and I decided that I would like to study undergraduate here. And throughout my undergraduate career, I was even further impressed and decided to do a postgraduate degree. I like the idea of Stellenbosch University because it has a student vibe. You have the whole campus within walking distance of your residence. Um, it was beautiful, it seemed fun. I personally studied at WITS and I really did not like city life. So I figured Stellenbosch would be the nice town and would be conducive for studying for me. So I came to Stellenbosch and it is one of the best universities. So, so I've only been at Stellenbosch for about two years now and um, I've really enjoyed this, my experience here. The faculty is absolutely fantastic. The faculty members and the support staff are um, brilliant. They're very friendly. There's really a sense of community in the faculty. Um, everyone here really wants to see you succeed and not only succeed in your projects and your degree, but also excel in, in this principle of chemical engineering. Um, Stellenbosch, I must say, one of, one of the things that really puts it in a league of its own is that sense of community. It's the people that, that, that I've met here, um, I mean, for me, being a Marty means being part of a group of um, competent people who, who are driven and, and who really want to make something of themselves. Stellenbosch University, um, being not so far from where I live in Somerset West, um, my older brother also went to Stellenbosch and um, based on his success, I also wanted to, you know, invest in my future through here. And ultimately, if you want to do engineering, as what I'm promoting as well, Stellenbosch University offers, you know, the best experience when it comes to developing high quality engineers. We have an astounding reputation for, um, you know, as I say, producing these engineers, especially process engineering. So, yeah, would highly recommend that if you want the best engineering experience. We look forward to welcoming you to the Department of Chemical Engineering when you decide to come and study with us. Chemical engineering is an exciting and growing field. We are uh, at the forefront of figuring out new ways to make materials and use materials, recycle things that have been discarded um, and make things in a green way. Environmental engineering is growing and we are using all the techniques and tools that we've developed um, over the last century of chemical engineering so that we make a better world for the future. Um, Stellenbosch University has excellent facilities and I'm sure that you will have an excellent time, a wonderful time studying here with us. Mm -hmm.